The Battle of Xiangyong was a protracted series of battles between the invading Mongols of the Yuan dynasty and Chinese Southern Song forces from AD 1267 to 1273. The battle was a significant victory for the Mongol Empire and ended a 30-year defensive campaign waged by the Song dynasty, allowing the Mongols to advance into the Chinese heartland. The capture of Xiangyong also allowed the Mongols to take control of the Han and Yangtze rivers, thereby depriving the Song dynasty of two formidable natural barriers. The defeat devastated the Song dynasty, which collapsed several years later at the Battle of Yemen. The battle consisted of skirmishes, ground assault, and the siege of the twin fortified cities of Fanqing and Xiangyong in modern-day Hubei, China. Lu Wenwan, commander-in-chief of the Southern Song dynasty, surrendered to Kublai Khan in 1273. The conventional use of Mongolian cavalry was restricted by the woody terrain and numerous military outposts of China. Chinese firearms and cannons were employed by the Mongols in the victorious siege of Fanqing after capturing the outposts and relieving Chinese forces from Sichuan and Yuizhou, which broke through the siege but was eventually defeated. The use of the counterweight trebuchet by the Mongols proved especially effective. Chapter 1 Background Before the rule of Kublai Khan, the Mongols had launched military campaigns as far as Eastern Europe, and had conquered Russia, Siberia, Tibet, Korea, North China, Yunnan, Iraq, Anatolia, and Iran. However, the Song dynasty was difficult to conquer because of the strategic location of Xiangyong, which became a vital position for Kublai to capture and hold. The city guarded the waterways of South China because the Han River was a major tributary into the Yangtze River. Once the city fell, the Mongols obtained easy access into important southern cities in China, and the Southern Song would collapse shortly after. The Southern Song knew the importance of this vital spot, and treated the defense of Xiangyong as important as their capital. The city was surrounded by mountains on three sides, and a river on one side. Song stored massive amount of supplies inside the fortress, as preparation for long sieges. They also built high walls and towers on all four sides of the fortress. Each entrance of the fortress had at least two layers of walls, used to trap enemy sieging forces inside. In 1133, the famous Song general Yue Fei led many successful campaigns against the Jin dynasty, in the Xiangyong area. From there, he pushed the Jin army back north as far as Kaifeng. In 1234, the Jin dynasty was conquered by the Mongols under the leadership of Ogdi. At that time, Mongols and the Southern Song dynasty were allies. After that, the two former allies did not have any common enemy. The Song killed Mongol envoys and attempted to invade the Mongol territories. Xiangyong surrendered to the army of the Mongol Empire without resistance in 1236. But the Mongols voluntarily left the city after it was briefly held by them in 1236-38. The twin cities of Xiangyong Fenchang, with walls almost 5 kilometers around and 200,000 people, withstood a Mongol assault in 1257. The Mongolian cavalry were lured in Xiangyong, where they were slaughtered by the Song defenders due to the fortress double-layered wall design. When a Mongol contingent entered the entrance of the fortress, the Mongol forces would be slaughtered to the last man, while trapped between four walls. The Mongols lifted the siege of Xiangyong. The sudden death of Mong Khan forced the imperial army of the Mongol Empire to withdraw from the Song territory in 1259-60. In 1260, Kublai Khan was proclaimed successor to the throne after the death of his brother Monk, as was his youngest brother Arik Boke. The succession war between him and Enric Bokeh began. Kublai Khan won the war eventually, though his claim as the successor to Monk was only partially recognized by the Mongols in the West. In 1271, Kublai Khan renamed his empire Yuan, establishing the Yuan dynasty, instead of Ik Mongol Uls. After defeating his rivals and opponents in Mongolia and northern China, Kublai Khan also wanted to continue his grandfather Genghis Khan's conquest of China. In 1267, 
Kublai Khan ordered a Jew and the Song defector Lu Zeng to attack Xiangyong and Fencheng. General Lu Zeng had levied corruption charges against Lu Zeng, the Lu Zhou prefect, causing Lu Zeng to defect to the Mongols in 1261. Chapter 2 The Siege A Jew and Lu Zeng arrived in 1268 and blockaded the city with a ring of forts. Lu Zeng had advised the cities be starved from Sichuan by building forts there. The Mongols probed the defenses of Xiangyong and Fanqing. The Yuan Mongols learned from their mistake, and this time brought along with them about a hundred trebuchets. These trebuchets had a shooting range of around 100 meters, and could use projectiles of around 50 kilograms. During Mongol campaigns against the Jin dynasty, the Mongols used about 5,000 trebuchets, and they were very successful in destroying the Jin fortresses. LV Wendy commanded the Song dynasty's Yangtze and his son-in-law Fan Wenu and son LV Wenwan commanded Xiangyong. However the twin cities had expected an assault by bombardment and prepared for it. The city moat was expanded to a width of 150 meters, forcing Yuan siege weapons to set up at a distance. In addition to reinforcing their walls with clay, they made netting screens 10 centimeters thick and 10 meters in length to cover them and dampen projectile impact. As a result, the Yuan siege weapons were both ineffective and inaccurate, and the few shots that did land bounced off the wall harmlessly. Chapter 2 Section 1 Mongol Entrapment The Mongols then started to block Xiangyong off from the rest of Song. A Yuan fleet of 5,000 ships was established, to stop any Song supplies from the Han River. The Han River was blockaded with five stone platforms capped by arbalests. The Mongol trained 70,000 marines but Song food supplies still held out in 1271. The Yuan also sent forces to go around the fortress, and set up camps at the key roads, to stop Song supplies from land. Eventually, Yuan built their own forts at these key locations. From late 1267 to 1271, Song reinforcements from the south tried, many times, to attack the Mongol positions, in order to supply Xiangyong, but outside of Xiangyong, the Song forces were no match for the Mongolian cavalry. The catalogue of useless thrusts continued, the Chinese losing 1000 in October 1270, 2000 in August, 1271, and most of a 3000 strong force, was destroyed the following month. Once the Yuan forts were completed, the situation became hopeless. As a result, the Song forces inside Xiangyong had to depend on themselves. The Song had stored years of supplies within Xiangyong. However, by 1271, the fortress finally ran low on their supplies. Still, the Song troops chose to hang on. Finally, in 1272, a small Song force of 3,000 men was able to break through the Yuan naval blockade, and supplied Xiangyong from the Han River. The force, led by two men both named Zhang, commanded a hundred paddlewheel boats, traveling by night under the light of lantern fire, was discovered early on by a Mongol commander. When the Song fleet arrived near the cities, they found the Mongol fleet to have spread themselves out along the entire width of the Yangtze with vessels, spread out, filling the entire surface of the river, and there was no gap for them to enter. Another defensive measure the Mongols had taken was the construction of a chain, which stretched across the water. The two fleets engaged in combat and the Song opened fire with fire lances, fire bombs, and crossbows. A large number of men died trying to cut through chains, pull up stakes, and hurl bombs, while Song marines fought hand to hand using large axes, and according to the Mongol record, on their ships they were up to the ankles in blood. With the rise of dawn, the Song vessels made it to the city walls and the citizens leapt up a hundred times in joy. This was a major morale boost to the defenders. However, no one could get back out to inform others of the success. The Song officials considered that reinforcement lost and Xiangyong, doomed to fall from the lack of supplies, did not send more Song reinforcements afterwards. 
The high casualties and low success rates ended the transportation of further supplies. Dotaju realized that the twin cities were hard to take with Mongol cavalry, and wrote to Kublai that he needed Chinese infantry. Kublai reinforced him with 20,000 men. Chapter 2 Section 2 New Weapon of the Yuan Forces The defense of Xiangyong came to an end in 1273, with the introduction of the counterweight trebuchet. Because the Han Chinese commander Gokan fought with the Mongols under Hulagu in the Middle East, Kublai had heard of siege engines of great effectiveness. Experts Ismail and Al Aldin were sent by Abaka, Il Khan of Persia, to China by the decree of Kublai Khan in 1272. They built the powerful Mangonels under the Uyghur general Arikjia by March, 1273. These counterweight trebuchets had a shooting range of 500 meters, and could launch projectiles weighing over 300 kilograms. On top of their power, these new trebuchets were much more accurate than the old ones, and were the only artillery capable of reaching the walls of Xiangyong. Yuan forces built about 20 of them, and used them to assist the siege of Xiangyong. The Mongols started the siege with Fanqing in early 1273. Song soldiers in Xiangyong witnessed a giant rock which flew right over the gigantic walls of Fanqing, and hit the houses inside. Under the cover of bombardment, the Yuan army was able to fill the moat and take the walls, after which followed an assault by a cavalry, and the storming of the city resulted in high casualties on both sides. Fanqing, after holding out for years, suddenly fell within a few days. The Yuan Mongol army then turned their attention to Xiangyong. Lu Wenwan sent a messenger to Emperor Duzong of Song, to request immediate reinforcements. The messenger successfully got by the Yuan forts and reached the emperor. But upon hearing the effectiveness of these new trebuchets, the emperor considered Xiangyong lost and did not send reinforcements. For the next few days, Song soldiers looked to the south for reinforcements, but all they saw were Yuan siege weapons and the Mongols waiting to end their lives. The position of Song forces worsened. In February, Yuan siege weapons began bombarding the city and a shot happened to hit a stone bridge inside. When the stone landed, it made a thunderous noise. Song soldiers went to check the damage, and saw that the stone had sunk a few feet into the solid ground. Yuan bombardment began to collapse the city structures as well as reduce the drum tower and turrets on the city walls. Lu Wenwan surrendered the city on the 14th of March 1273. He was made governor of Xiangyang and Fanqing under Yuan rule as part of the terms. Chapter 3: Aftermath. Xiangyang, the strongest fortress of the Song dynasty, had fallen. As a result, Yuan forces were free to conquer the rest of southern China. Everywhere else Yuan went, Song fortresses defected as the defecting Song commander in Xiangyong, Lu Wenwan, ordered other members of his family commanding Song forces to defect the Yuan. In 1275, the Song government unsuccessfully attempted to form a truce, but by then the act was too late. Many people agree that the fall of Xiangyong essentially marked the end of the Song dynasty. For example, Paul K. Davis wrote, Mongol victory broke the Southern Sung dynasty, leading to the establishment of the Yuan dynasty. For the six years that Yuan sieged Xiangyong, Song were unable to regroup and strike back at Yuan with their resources in the south. In fact, they could not even get much reinforcements and supplies to Xiangyong, to support the hard-working defense there. The Emperor of the Song Dynasty abdicated on 4 February 1276. Chapter 4, Role of Chinese-Designed Gunpowder Weapons Both the Song and Mongol forces had thunder crash bombs during the siege, a type of gunpowder weapon. The Mongols also utilized siege crossbows and traction trebuchets. The Song forces used fire arrows and fire lances in addition to their own thunder crash bombs. The Song forces also used paddle ships. Siege crossbows and firebombs were also deployed on Song ships against Mongol forces, in addition to fire lances. The name of the bombs in Chinese was Zen Tian Lei. 
They were made from cast iron and filled with gunpowder, the Chinese Song forces delivered them to the enemy via trebuchets. Armor made out of iron could be penetrated by pieces of the bomb after the explosion, which had a 50 km noise range. Chapter 5, Role of the Counterweight Trebuchet Since the Yuan employed Muslim engineers for the designing of the counterweight trebuchets, they were designated in Chinese historiography as the Muslim trebuchet. The Chinese scholar Zheng Sixiao indicates that, in the case of the largest ones, the wooden framework stood above a hole in the ground. After a Jew asked Kublai, the emperor of the Mongol Empire, the powerful siege machines of the Ilkhanate, Ismail and Aluddin from Iraq arrived in South China to construct a new type of trebuchet which used explosive shells. These Muslim engineers built mangonels and trebuchets for the siege. Explosive shells had been in use in China for centuries but what was new was the counterweight type of trebuchet as opposed to the torsion type giving greater range and accuracy as it was easier to judge the weight of the counterweight than the torsion generated by repeated windings. The counterweight trebuchet built by the Muslims from Mosul were longer in range, and assisted in destroying Fanqing. Chinese and Muslim engineers operated artillery and siege engines for the Mongol armies. The design was taken from those used by Hulagu to batter down the walls of Baghdad. The Chinese were the first to invent the traction trebuchet, now they faced Muslim-designed counterweight trebuchets in the Mongol army. The Chinese responded by building their own counterweight trebuchets, an account from the Chinese said in 1273 the frontier cities have all fallen. But Muslim trebuchets were constructed with new and ingenious improvements, and different kinds became available, far better than those used before. Chapter 5 Section 1, The Design of the Trebuchets Deployed at Xiangyang The Chinese scholar Zheng Sixiao indicates that, in the case of the largest ones, the wooden framework stood above a hole in the ground. Another version is given by Marco Polo in his book Il Milioni where he claims having been responsible for teaching the Mongols how to build and use catapults during the siege of Xiangyong. However, the names of the Muslim engineers were given by Muslim sources as Talib and his sons Abu Bakr, Ibrahim, and Muhammad, respectively by Chinese sources as Alauddin and Ismail. Moreover, it has been claimed the siege had already ended before Marco Polo's arrival in China. Chapter 6, Role of Political Infighting in the Song Court Political infighting among the Song also contributed to the fall of Xiangyong and Fanqing, due to the power of the Lu family, many questioned their allegiance to the Song. The Emperor Bard Jia Sidao himself from the command, so Li Tingzi, an enemy of the Lu family, was appointed commander. Jia permitted the Luce to ignore Li's orders, resulting in a fractious command. Li was then unable to relieve Xiangyong and Fanqing, managing only temporary resupply during several breaks in the siege. 